I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. That's going to be our text today. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device and you are in the room, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats that are around you. Turn to page 1051 and you will find our text. You'll find Luke chapter 24. You'll be able to follow along with us. And, uh, and if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, by all means, take that one with you. Because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Now, if you're joining us online, we're glad to have you as well. And if you don't have a Bible and you want one, please contact us. Let us know. We would be glad to get you one too because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God is going to change your life as well. Hey, uh, let me just say thank you to all of you that are in the room and joining us at 3.30 on uh, Easter Saturday. Okay? I appreciate that. Because uh, it speaks to your selflessness, it speaks to your concern about other people, it speaks to your love of Jesus and the fact that somebody is listening to me when I make requests. So I appreciate that. As a man who's been happily married for almost 37 years, I really appreciate that. So uh, thank you for being here uh, today. And by the way, happy Easter. You know? It, it is. Uh, hey, did you have fun getting ready to come to church today? Now, I, I ask that question, and I look around, and everybody looks exactly like they do every other time I see you in church. Uh, so, let, can we just admit, it's not like it used to be when we got ready to go to church for Easter, right? Anybody remember the old days when, yeah, yeah, okay, a lot of hands go up, and, and, and look, can I just tell you, there were some times I really, really hated Easter. Not because of Easter, but because of how we had to get dressed up for Easter, I mean, look, uh, we always got dressed up for church anyway, but on Easter, you know, my mom got the, the, the little short suit outfit. <laughs> I had older brothers, and uh, the abuse I took from them, uh, calling me a sissy because I'm wearing short pants and a bow tie, took me uh, not more than a decade or so of counseling to get over, but uh, that's okay. Hey, uh, I, you know, it, it just... My girls, you know, they look so cute in the matching dresses when they were little that, uh, you know, uh, Meralda found for them. But looking back at the pictures, they just go, why did you have to dress this in matching dresses? Why did you have to do that? Uh, you know, but the best part, let's just face it. If you flash back to those days of getting dressed up for Easter, uh, the best part was getting dressed and, you know, it's a half hour before you have to leave and your mom threatens you. Don't you dare get anything on those clothes. Right? And so you're, suddenly you're like bubble boy because you're living afraid to touch anything, eat anything, drink anything because what if you spill? Or is the best part dad sitting in the car honking the horn every 15 seconds going, come on, let's go. So, uh, hey, whatever you went through to get here today, I am glad that you're here. And by the way, you look marvelous. <laughs> okay? Just saying. And if you've got some new Easter clothes, congratulations. We are happy for you. Uh, hey, so my question today is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? And, and, and I understand asking that question, are you ready, is a loaded question because we just survived a year that none of us were ready for. I mean, a year ago, we weren't even meeting in person. Everything was online. And uh, it was the strangest Easter ever, if we just go ahead and acknowledge that, because, you know, you weren't able to gather, you weren't able to celebrate together, and yes, you were watching in your living room, and we have a lot of people watching in our living room right now, uh, but uh, it's different when you're singing, and yeah, I mean, you can't turn the TV up as loud as this band gets, and, and uh, drown yourself out, right? Uh, so, it, you suddenly you hear, you sound like that all the time when you sing? But we weren't ready for this last year. It, you know, it, all the different things that came with that. And, and that's so fitting for Easter because the people involved in the very first Easter definitely were not ready. They were not ready. Okay, Jesus came into Jerusalem on Sunday before Easter, right? Uh, it's Palm Sunday. It's when he enters to the shouts of the crowd, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people are expecting a political Messiah from Jesus. They expect him to lead a revolution, a rebellion against Rome, and he doesn't. 
And then Thursday, he gathers, Maundy Thursday, with the disciples in the upper room to celebrate the Passover. He institutes the Last Supper. He washes the disciples' feet, and then he tells them, hey, by the way, one of you is gonna betray me. And they are all incredulous with, not, not me, surely not me. And he tells them that all of them are gonna abandon him. And they all protest, saying, never, I will never abandon you, I will never do that. He looks at Peter and says, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter swears that he will die before he does that. You see, they weren't ready for the truth. They weren't ready for the truth. And, and then the disciples, Mary, the other followers of Jesus, watched in horror as Jesus was arrested. He was put on a trial that was a sham of justice, as a complete miscarriage of justice. And then he was condemned to death and then he was crucified in front of them. And, and, and they grieved, some from close by and most from afar, because they were not ready for the pain of losing Jesus. And then came Easter morning. That Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. Now, just curiosity, do you think they were ready for what they found that morning. Now, let's read the story and see how ready they were. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse one. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. See, were they ready for the resurrection? It's not a trick question. You guys can answer out loud. Were, you, were they ready for the resurrection? No, not at all. I mean, come on, the women went to the tomb to cover the dead body of Jesus with spices and give him a decent burial. That's why they went to the tomb. They did not go to the tomb expecting great things. They went to the tomb to grieve in the traditional way. Saturday had been the Sabbath, so they couldn't do it on Saturday. They had to wait till Sunday morning, so they went Sunday morning to do it, and Jesus wasn't there. And they didn't know why he wasn't there. And the angels surprised them, and they said that great question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then they went and told the apostles and the other disciples with them, and they disbelieved. They, they didn't believe them. They considered their reports an idle tale. You see, they were not ready for the end of the story. God totally surprised them with the resurrection, even though Jesus repeatedly told them what would happen. Just read the Gospels. It, it amazes me. You see, they were not ready for the end. The story was different than their expectations. So again, I'm gonna ask you, are you ready? First of all, are you ready for the truth? All right, somebody is, I like that. Way to go, Emily. Good answer. See, are you ready for the truth? Because the truth is God loves you. The truth is God loves you. We say that a lot, and people hear us say that a lot. God loves you. But a lot of times we think God loves you to the masses, to the, the non-specific. But we're talking about you. This is individual. This is personal. God loves you. You know, he made you. He thinks you're wonderful, and he loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that he died to save you. The Apostle John writes this in his first letter. He says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. 
God loves us, and, and he showed us that love in Jesus, and that he sent Jesus into this world to be our Savior. So God loves you. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, the God of all creation loves you. And the truth is, not only does God love you, but God forgives you. God forgives you the moment that you ask. Grace abounds to us the moment that we request it. Again, in the first letter of the Apostle John, he says, if we, that's us, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sin and purify us of all unrighteousness. What a promise. It's a promise of forgiveness. And the truth is, God will forgive you if you ask. All you have to do is ask, Jesus, will you forgive me? The answer is yes. He's waiting to forgive you. That's the truth. A lot of you sometimes disbelieve that. You think, well, but if you only knew what I've done. You know, I don't know what you've done, but God does. God knows exactly what you've done, and he still makes that offer. If you confess, he will forgive. Not only will he forgive, but he'll purify you of all unrighteousness. He will declare you clean. He'll declare you holy. It, it, that, that's an amazing truth. I hope you're ready to hear that truth today, that not only does God love you, but God forgives you. And the truth is, God wants to give you life and bless you incredibly. See, uh, you know, like if your church experience was a little bit like mine growing up, uh, that message sometimes got lost in there. Sometimes the message was, well, you know, Jesus will give you eternal life, but right now it sucks. Right now it's not so good. So just tough it up, put that smile on your face that you don't see anybody else at church wearing, and then carry on. See, I, I mean, that, that's kind of, but, but these are the words of Jesus. He said, the thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, have it overflowing. I mean, that's kind of cool. Jesus wants to bless us. He wants to you know, pour out his love into our lives. He wants us to experience his grace. And, and, but are you ready for that truth? Are you ready for the truth that eternal life is only found in Jesus? Eternal life is only found in Jesus. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus came into this world to suffer and die for our sin so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Okay, but, but here's the thing. It's, it's about believing in him. It's about trusting in him. That's why the Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. That's the truth. That's the life-changing, eternity, destiny-altering truth that is offered to us. Now, the disciples weren't ready for the truth. Do you know that? The disciples actually argued with Jesus when he told them about the crucifixion. He told, he told Peter about it. He said, I gotta go to Jerusalem and get crucified. And Peter said, I'm not gonna let that happen. And Jesus called him Satan. He, he told you know, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times. And Peter said, no, I'll never do that. And he did. And, and then you know, the disciples all said, oh no, we're not gonna abandon you. We're gonna stand with you even if we have to die. And of course, they all ran away. See, here's the point. If you argue with Jesus, you're always gonna lose the argument because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so, are you ready for the truth? Do you agree with Jesus that he is the way to life? So are you ready? Are you ready for the truth, and are you ready for the pain? Are you ready for the pain? I know that's a strange question to ask, because none of us like pain. We want to avoid pain. I know I do. Uh, you know, that's why we don't really like going to the dentist. Anybody else? I go into the dentist, yeah. Because we want to avoid the pain. And yet, the question is, are you ready for the pain? Because I'm sure you've noticed by now that life hurts. And the older you get, the more it hurts. There's giggling there, not amens. I kind of thought. <laughs> but see, here's the question. We know life hurts. Do you know why life hurts? See, 
it hurts because we've been living in rebellion against God since Adam and Eve. You know, God created a perfect world, and he, he placed people in it. He gave them one rule. It had to be a dietary rule, so of course we failed. We rebelled against God, and when we rebelled against God, sin entered the world, and through sin, death, and therefore everyone dies because everyone has sinned. Look, we participate in this. Yes, it was passed down to us by our ancestors, but we've certainly engaged in the same rebellion. I mean, we're selfish and self-destructive, and we hurt ourselves, and we hurt others, and others hurt us, and even creation is out of control. That's why there's natural disasters and diseases and, that, that ravage people. And here's the thing. Jesus never promised to take our pain away in this world. Okay, Jesus didn't promise to take our pain away in this world. Now, one day, he, he will take our pain away, but that's in heaven where Scripture tells us that God himself, uh, or there, there'll be no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain. Okay, so it'll, that, there'll be an existence without pain, but it's not now. It's not in this world. And, and if you know Jesus, so that's the world that's promised to you, uh, if you've embraced that truth, that he's the way and the truth and the life. But... Um, but for today, Jesus is not your pain reliever. Jesus is your pain redeemer. Okay, let me say that again. I want you to get that. Jesus is not today in this world your pain reliever. Jesus wants to be your pain redeemer. So what does that mean? Psalm 147 says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Do you hear that? God heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. It does not say that God prevents your heart from being broken or from you getting any wounds. You see, God is about redeeming our pain. He's about healing our brokenness. And, and if you don't know what redeeming the pain looks like, it, it means this. He takes our, uh, our broken lives and he creates something beautiful out of them. See, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and we celebrate life change here. And we've got story after story after story of people who's got, who God has changed their lives dramatically. And he's given them new hope. And he's taken them from, from places where you say there's no hope. And he's given them life. And he's redeemed their relationships. And he's given them a fresh start. And now they're able to praise God and lead others to him and build lives. That's what redemption looks like. And if you find yourself in a place today where you are broken and life is shattered and, and you are struggling to find hope, understand that God wants to redeem even your pain. Even your pain. That's what he wants to do. Hear it again, Psalm 147. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You see, Easter is a beautiful picture of God redeeming the pain. I mean, Easter itself is a picture of the promise that God wants to visit into your life. It begins with betrayal, with false accusations, a terrible miscarriage of justice. Add to that beatings, mockery, the torture of the crucifixion, despair, fear, hopelessness. Those are the norm. And then what does God do? All of that pain is redeemed through the power and the triumph of the resurrection. All of what they thought was lost suddenly is found. All of that which they thought was irredeemably broken is now made whole. Their lives that they considered shattered and purposeless now are put back together better than they were before and they have purpose that is eternal. That's what God does in the Easter story and that's how God redeems our pain. That's how God redeems your pain. So do you want God to redeem your pain? Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> it's like, well, it's pretty good right now, so I don't know. Could it get better? Yes, it could. So if you want God to redeem your pain, then you have to trust God in the pain. Let me say that again. If, if you really want God to redeem your life, no matter how broken it is, you have to trust God in the midst of the pain. In other words, you don't stop believing. You don't just get angry and walk away. 
You don't give up hope even though it seems hopeless. Even when it, you can't see any way that it could work out, if you just hold on to Jesus and know that he's going to redeem your pain, you'll see it happen. Because even when you lose hope, God is still redeeming our brokenness. That's the story of Easter. Now, here's the crazy thing. And, and, and this goes to the Easter story. And, and I think about this more and more, and, and, and you maybe can ponder this too. Jesus had told the disciples directly, specifically, at least, at least three times that he was going to go to Jerusalem, get handed over to evil men, get crucified, and rise from the dead. Read the Gospels. It's there. And, and, and he tells them again, and he tells them again, and he tells them again. And then when it happens, they don't believe it. Okay, they're not ready for it. They're not looking for it. You talk about losing hope. You talk about despairing. You talk about giving up. That's where they were. And then, surprise, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. That, that's how God is working. So here's, here's what we have. We have his words written down where he's told us over and over and over again, I love you, I'm with you, I'm gonna redeem this. I'm, hold on, I, I, there's, uh, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those called according to his purpose. God's going to redeem your life if you don't give up, if you don't lose hope, if you don't just stay angry. So if you want to see God redeem your life, just keep trusting him even in the middle of the pain. So today, are you ready for the pain? Because God is ready to redeem. Just, just know that because of the, we live in this broken world, the pain is coming, but know that God is working right now to redeem your brokenness. So I hope you're ready for the truth. I hope you're ready for the pain. Finally, are you ready for the end? Are you ready for the end of your story, of the story? I know some of you right now are going, that is such a sick question to ask on Easter. What is wrong with you, preacher? Why are you getting morbid on Easter? Well, I don't know if you guys have paid any attention or not, but Easter is the story of death and resurrection. Amen. Right? It's got both. You got to have both. To get to, you get to resurrection, somebody's got to die. Okay? Jesus doesn't suffer on the cross. There's no resurrection. We're not celebrating Easter. You guys do get that, right? So Easter is, you know, kind of a, a you know, it's morbid with victory all attached to it at the same time. So uh, are you ready for the end of your story? And, and, and Jesus challenged us. In Matthew 24, it's recorded as Jesus saying, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So some of you need to stop posting all that stuff about the end of times right now because if we're expecting it, it's not going to happen. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's just kind of occurred to me. Uh, so uh, <laughs> look, he's going to come at a time when you're not ready. So be ready is what he's challenging us. See, none of us knows when the end is going to be. We don't know when Jesus is going to return and claim his church as his own and conclude history as we know it. Uh, but... Here's the thing. We know that life is fragile. All of us have lost loved ones along the way. We've all grieved along the way. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says it's appointed unto us once to die and then to face judgment. And, and so we want to be ready. I mean, are you ready? I, I mean, and, and don't answer too quickly. I know the, the, you know the easy answer is, of course we're ready, of course we're ready. But the Bible is full of parables warning us to be ready. Uh, in fact, I encourage you to go home and uh, read Matthew 25. Okay, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Gospels. Matthew 25 has got three parables. All of them are asking the question, are you ready? They're parables of warning that Jesus tells just before he's crucified. Okay. They're, they're kind of a big deal. So go, they're, they're, they're parables warning us to be ready. And, and a lot of times we think we're ready and we're not. I know that because I lived my own parable a few years ago. 
Um, now, I don't know where your favorite vacation spot is. You guys can share that over dinner or lunch or whatever. I don't know where your favorite vacation spot is, but mine's Hawaii. Anybody else with me? Anybody want to go to Hawaii? Yeah. Oh, see, lots more hands went up suddenly. So, so I love Hawaii. So a few years ago, I had a chance, two weeks in Hawaii, and I planned the perfect trip. First week, you know, it's our kids are with us, and, uh, you know, so the beautiful beaches, the cliffs, the, the waterfalls, the canyons, we even did zip lining. Yeah, that's cool. If you're not afraid of heights, it's cool. And so, uh, and then our kids flew home, and uh, some friends came out. We did all the same stuff, and, except we played golf on some amazing golf courses. Uh, it's another reason I love Hawaii. And so, uh, just had a great trip, and we're flying home, and, and as we're touching down in Vegas, and I remember this, uh, I looked over at Meralda and just said, do you have your house keys? And she said, no, I gave it to the house sitter. She goes, don't you have yours? And I said, no, I gave them to the kids so they could drive the car back from the airport. And so frantically, suddenly, and it's late at night, uh, we're, t- we're texting, you know, the house sitter had already locked her key in the house, yay. So I, I called the neighbors that have a key, because everybody's got a neighbor with a key, right, in case you're really stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and they were out of town. And so now we're locked out of our own house. Now, we're riding back to have a seat with our friends that went with us anyway, so we got a ride. And, and they've got a, an extra room in their house. So like, yeah, you guys can crash in our house. So we're like, okay, it could be worse, but you know, we've been living out of a suitcase for a couple of weeks, so one more night's not gonna hurt anything. And so we roll into, you know, uh, their house and have to about 2 o'clock in the morning. We're tired, and we open the garage door, and as we started to go in, we got hit with this wave of putrescence. This, this horrific, gut-wrenching smell greeted us and, and just cascaded over us. And we're like, oh, what is that? Well, a breaker had flipped and killed the power in their garage, and they had a freezer in their garage. And the only thing it had in it was fresh fish. <laughs> Did I mention it was July? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, we had the perfect trip right up into the end, and then it stunk. <laughs> See, I don't want that to happen to you. I, I, I really don't want that to happen to you. Don't live your life thinking you've got it all planned and taken care of and and you're all ready and then end up locked out and stinking. I want you to be ready. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, have you come to that place where you've you know, committed your life to following Jesus. You've taken that step. You, you've said, I, I know I'm, I'm a sinner. I know I'm hopeless. I know I'm helpless. God, please save me. Again, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And, and, and we share that because we want you to be ready. We want you to, to know that you have eternal life. We want you to know that your sins are forgiven. We want you to know that God is with you and that he loves you and, and that he's gonna walk with you through the pain and take you to that place where there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain when this life is over. So are you ready to follow Jesus? Are you ready to let him change your life? If you are and you've never made that commitment before, Do me a favor, grab one of the Connect cards that are in the seats around you, fill it out, drop it in the offering box when you leave, that's your gift to us. Just just say, hey, here's here's the decision I made today and we'll contact you, we'll follow up with you, we wanna talk with you about what that means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're joining us online, you can message the online host and and they will give you some instructions or you can email us and we will respond to you because we wanna have that conversation with you wherever you are. You see, we want you to be ready. Now, if you're really brave, uh, fill out the card and then come find one of us and talk to us because we would love to rejoice with you and celebrate with you this new beginning in your life. And, and if you're don't, not quite that brave, then our prayer team will be here at the front after the service. They would love to pray with you and hear about how Jesus can change your life right now. 
You see, the disciples weren't ready for the resurrection. They weren't ready for the end of the story. My prayer is that you know the reality of the resurrection and you are ready for the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for changing our lives through Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us hope and life uh, through the sacrifice and resurrection of your son. And God, we recognize that we have no hope, no life apart from Jesus. And, and there are many of us in this room that are followers of Christ. And, and Lord, we haven't been living ready. So right now, we, we just recommit ourselves to you. We, we surrender again to pursuing you, to trusting you, to following you. And Father, for those that are on the verge of deciding to follow you, I pray that you would give them that courage to take that step of faith, that courage to respond and to say yes to the only one who can save their soul. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.